My name is Spencer Overton, and I'm a professor of law at GW Law School, where I teach and write on voting rights and campaign finance. I'm also the president of the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies, which is America's Black think tank. This month, as we continue our celebration of Black history, I'm joined by three distinguished public servants appointed to federal agencies that touch on our federal election system. They're here to discuss African-American participation in the political process. Now for context, uh, Americans voted at a historic rate of almost 68% in the 2020 election. For Black Americans, uh, the turnout rate exceeded 60% for the first time since 2012. Now that growth is not without its challenges as we've witnessed legislative battles at the state and federal levels over election administration, voting rights, and campaign finance law. Luckily, our three panelists are doing their parts to lead the country toward greater equality. Uh, we'll speak with them today about their work and about their personal journeys that have led them to their current posts. So without further delay, I'll begin by introducing our panelists and, and uh, discussants here. Now, the first thing we'll, is that we'll hear from Assistant Attorney General Kristen Clark who pre-recorded remarks for this panel. Now, uh, Kristen Clark is the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights uh, in the US Department of, of Justice, as, as I've mentioned. Now, in this role, she leads the Justice Department's broad federal civil rights enforcement efforts and works to uphold the civil and constitutional rights of all Americans, uh, as well as just everyone who lives in the United States. Assistant Attorney General Clark is a lifelong civil rights lawyer. She spent her entire career in public service. She began as a trial attorney in the Civil Rights Division through the Justice Department's Honors Program. And in 2006, she joined the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, where she defended the constitutionality of the Voting Rights Act, presented oral argument to the DC District Court in Shelby County versus Holder, and provided testimony on federal and state voting rights legislation. In 2015, uh, the Assistant Attorney General uh, was named, she was an Assistant Attorney General then, uh, she, she uh, was, was named the President and Executive Director of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. She received her uh, bachelor's degree from Harvard University and her JD from Columbia Law School. I'm Kristen Clark, the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights at the U.S. Department of Justice. I want to thank Commissioner Hicks for his work and for the invitation to join you today, and thank Commissioners Palmer, McCormick, and Hovland for their service. I look forward to working with the Election Assistance Commission to help improve election administration and find ways to advance the goals underlying the Help America Vote Act. As the head of the Civil Rights Division, I work with DOJ attorneys to make sure that everyone who is eligible to vote can register to vote, can vote on Election Day, that all of those votes are counted, and that the results of those votes are honored. As we gather today to celebrate Black History Month, I am humbled to say that I'm the first Black woman ever to serve as the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights. And I'm sure my colleagues, EAC Commissioner Hicks and FEC Commissioner Broussard would agree that none of us got to where we are alone. We stand on the shoulders of giants. The work of so many before us has brought us here today. Fannie Lou Hamer, John Lewis, Constance Baker Motley, Lonnie Guineer, and the list goes on. Even the Civil Rights Division that I now oversee did not always exist. Rather, it was born of the activism and organizing of the early Civil Rights Movement. The division was created as part of the Civil Rights Act of 1957, a bill so sweeping that Adam Clayton Powell Jr. called it, quote, the second emancipation. It's now our turn to make good on the promise of America. And to me, that means protecting our democracy in this time of profound challenge. 
The current assault on voting rights is alarming. In 2021, at least 19 states passed 34 laws restricting access to voting. More than 440 bills with provisions that restrict voting access have been introduced in 49 states in the 2021 legislative sessions. These numbers are extraordinary. State legislatures enacted far more restrictive voting laws in 2021 than in any year since the 1950s and 1960s. As Attorney General Merrick Garland observed in June of last year, there are many things that are open to debate in America, but the right of all eligible citizens to vote is not one of them. The right to vote is the cornerstone of our democracy, the right from which all other rights ultimately flow, end quote. In upholding our commitment to securing access to the ballot for all Americans, we have filed lawsuits and statements of interest across the country challenging laws, both new and old, that restrict the right to vote or make it harder for people of color to elect candidates of their choice. The Supreme Court's 2013 decision in Shelby County, Alabama versus Holder eliminated one of our most powerful and effective tools that came out of the voting rights movement. That tool, Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, offered an ingenious solution to the problem of states and localities coming up with new ways to bar Black, Latino, or Native American voters from participating equally. Governments had to prove before they made any changes to their election laws that those laws were non discriminatory. In the Supreme Court's description, Section 5 shifted the burden of time and inertia from the victims of discrimination to its perpetrators. We need Congress to act now to restore the Voting Rights Act. But I hope that all of us will use this Black History Month to redouble our efforts to make real the promises underlying the 14th and 15th Amendments, and press to enact robust and powerful tools for dealing with ongoing forms of voting discrimination today. Ensuring that all eligible Americans have access to the ballot box is critical to the health of our democracy. Ensuring that all citizens have voice in our democracy, particularly those who have historically faced disenfranchisement is a goal that we should all strive for. In response to that era's attempt to restrict the vote, Dr. Lar Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. organized at the Lincoln Memorial to deliver his famous give us the ballot speech. And in that speech, he acknowledged that voting alone isn't enough, that we must use that power and turn it into real change. But he also knew that without the power to vote, democracy dies. He said, quote, the denial of this sacred right is a tragic betrayal of the highest mandates of our democratic tradition. But Dr. King did not merely declare voting to be important. He implored the Black community directly to peacefully march, advocate, and press for voting rights as the way to save America herself. Quote, keep moving amid every mountain of opposition. If you will do that, when the history books are written in the future, the historians will have to look back and say, there lived a great people, a people who injected new meaning into the veins of civilization, a people which stood up with dignity and honor and saved civilization in her darkest hour. These words are just as on point and inspiring today as they were then. It serves as a powerful reminder of our collective obligation to work every day to make sure everyone in this country has equal access to this fundamental right. It's a tremendous honor to work with the other speakers here today and with you to keep moving amid every mountain of opposition 
to finally reach justice together. Thank you. We appreciate Assistant Attorney General Clark for her leadership. And now we'll turn to a discussion with three leading commissioners from agencies that help facilitate democracy in our nation. Commissioner Shauna Brassard joined the Federal Election Commission in 2008 initially as an attorney in the Enforcement Division of the Office of the General Counsel. Uh, in 2015, she was assigned on detail as counsel for Commissioner uh, Stephen Walther, uh, advising the commissioner during his tenure as chair in 2017 and continuing in that role until her own appointment as commissioner in December 2020. Now, Commissioner Broussard was previously uh, an attorney advisor at the IRS uh, Office of Professional Responsibility and Deputy Disciplinary Counsel at the Louisiana Attorney Disciplinary Board. She also worked as a New Orleans Assistant uh, District Attorney and was appointed in that role to the Violent Offenders Strike Force. Commissioner Broussard is a proud alumna of two historically Black universities, uh, earning her BA from Dillard University and her JD uh, cum laude from Southern University uh, Law Center. Uh, as, a, as a graduate of, of Hampton University, I'm, I'm both proud of her and also have a little bit of a rivalry, uh, of course, with her. Uh, she's an active member of Delta Sigma Theta sorority, and she's focused on making a positive impact on the Northern Virginia community. Debo Adegbele is a commissioner on the US Commission on Civil Rights where he served since 2016. He's also a partner at Wilmer, Cutler, uh, uh, Pickering, Hale, and Door, which I think now we often call Wilmer Hale. Uh, that's a position he's held since 2014. He previously served as senior counsel to the chair of the US Senate Judiciary Committee. And before being on Capitol Hill, he held several leadership roles at the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, including acting president and director of litigation. Now, during his time at LDF, Commissioner Adegbele argued two of the most significant civil rights cases in decades before the US Supreme Court. Northwest Austin Municipal Utility District number one versus Holder, uh, and then also Shelby County uh, versus Holder. Commissioner Adegbele received a BA from Connecticut College and a JD from NYU uh, School of Law. Finally, we're joined by Commissioner Thomas Hicks of the US Election Assistance Commission. Uh, he was nominated by President Barack Obama and confirmed by unanimous consent uh, by the US Senate on December 16th, uh, 2014. For the third time, He's currently serving as chair of the commission. Now, under his leadership, Chairman Hicks has focused his efforts on voter access, leading the commission in developing a, a pocket-sized voter card in braille and large print for voters with disabilities. Uh, previously, Commissioner Hicks was senior elections counsel and minority elections counsel on the U.S. House of Representatives Committee on House Administration. He was also a senior lobbyist and policy analyst for Common Cause and served in the Office of Congressional Relations for the Office of Personnel Management in the Clinton administration. Commissioner Hicks received his JD from Catholic University of America, Columbus School of Law, and his BA in government from another HBCU, uh, Clark uh, University uh, here. Now, I'll turn it over to the commissioners uh, uh, for some brief remarks before returning with a roundtable discussion. Uh, let's begin with Commissioner Hicks. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Commissioner Thomas Hicks, Chairman of the United States Election Assistance Commission. Before I begin, I would like to thank the panelists for being with us here today, as well as Professor Overton. And while the Assistant Attorney General could not join us in person, we very much appreciate the time she took to record her remarks about the Justice Department's role and priorities in our electoral system. 
This panel coincides with my first week as chair of the commission. It is the third time I'm serving as chair, and I'm excited about my upcoming term, which coincides with the 20th anniversary of the Help America Vote Act. It also coincides with Black History Month, which is why we're gathered the top officials who oversee various aspects of our federal election system to discuss how our work impacts the community. To begin, the EAC is an independent bipartisan federal agency created by the Help America Vote Act of 2002 to help election officials improve the administration of elections and help Americans participate in the voting process. We work closely with state and local election officials to provide resources to help make sure everything is in order for voters to cast a meaningful, secure, and independent ballot. By statute, our agency is responsible for distributing federal funds to the states. In addition to HAVA funds, the EAC has managed to distribute and manage of election security grants for states to protect their systems from interference. 2018 and 2020 marked the first time since 2010 that Congress authorized funds to provide grants to states with the emphasis on election security. As Congress puts together another spending bill, we have high hopes they continue to prioritize election security. In 2020, the agency was also responsible for allocating $400 million that the US Congress provided to states in emergency funding to deal with elections during COVID-19 pandemic. And I'm proud to note that our agency accomplished this within 30 days. <coughs> the agency also establishes standards for voting technology used in our elections. Voluntary voting system guidelines are a set of specific requirements against which voting systems can be detested to determine if systems meet required standards. The EAC first adopted VVSG in, in December 2005. Last February, we adopted VVSG 2.0. VVSG 2.0 is a major step forward to ensure the next generation of voting equipment is more secure, accessible, and ensures a better working experience for all Americans, but better voting experience for all Americans. And we're working diligent, diligently to implement this version so that manufacturers can build to these specifics. Importantly, we also serve as the clearinghouse for best practices that state and local authorities can consult for running their election operations. Recently, the EAC established a new clearinghouse department, primarily focused on developing valuable practices and other guides for election officials. This team is composed of several local election officials from across the country to serve as subject matter experts. In addition to their over 50 years of combined experience, these professionals also hold graduate degrees, certifications, and awards for innovation. Their expertise in this field builds on the expertise of the EAC staff. In 2021, the EAC Clearinghouse Department released a chain of custody best practices document that outlines items election officials should consider when developing or revising their chain of custody procedures for physical election materials, voting systems, and the use of third-party vendors for conducting elections and electronic discovery. The EAC also released an updated ter terminology glossary with nearly 1,300 terms and phrases used in the administration of elections. These documents are just the start of the growing library of new resources we're adding to the EAC. In a vacuum, these responsibilities sound less exciting than the good trouble our late and beloved Congressman John Lewis encouraged to secure the franchise. But as Congressman Lewis knew all too well, the rules of the game, including the rules about who can play, often dictate the outcome. We've seen that in this time of heightened inequality, black and brown communities bear a disproportionate burden and fewer options. 
So as one, one current example, when poll locations close because of a historic shortage of poll workers, communities with a higher proportion of urban minorities suffer the consequences. Fewer poll locations mean longer lines. Longer lines mean some voters cannot afford to wait just because to cast their votes. Ultimately, not voting because of factors like long lines is certain to communities is disenfranchisement. And voter disenfranchisement does not restrict itself to polls on election day. This brings us, <clears throat> this brings us to the issue of myths and disinformation. This, this issue is not new, but the types of media now available has allowed bad actors to scale their efforts to a level unimaginable before the digital age. The influence campaign that penetrated the 2016 and 2020 elections season seemed succeeded not only because of the wide availability of online tools, but because bad actors took advantage of the lack of social media literacy by users to spread mis- and disinformation with just the click of a mouse. While there is certainly a level of an individual responsibility tied to social media literacy, social media companies in the tech sector more generally acknowledged in testimony before the US Congress that they were late to recognize that these threats and established guardrails to protect users. Similarly, government, the media, and civic engagement organizations had a role to educate the public about these threats. And that's where our agency, alongside other federal partners, state and local governments, seems to make the difference. On January 25th, we launched National Poll Worker Recruitment Day to recruit a new generation of poll workers to step up as older generations of poll workers were encouraged or decided to stay home safe from the virus during the 2020 election. National Voter Registration Day also returns September 22nd. This is not only an effort to register new voters, but to encourage every eligible voter to check their registration information and make sure that it's up to date. This ensures that mail-in ballots arrive on time and that the wait times at the polling place are as short as possible. In this way, we can begin to restore faith in the democratic process while expanding opportunities for those voices traditionally marginalized from this discussion. I wanna thank you and I really look forward to this discussion. Back to you, uh, Professor Oberton. And now we'll turn to Commissioner Broussard. Commissioner Broussard? Unmuting works in this atmosphere. <laughs> I wanna say good morning. Um, good morning to everyone and thank you to Chairman Hicks and his staff for gathering this panel as part of the EAC's Black History Month celebrations. As a commissioner with the Federal Election Commission, I am happy to speak on current issues within campaign finance law and its impact on the African-American community and on other groups. Diversity is a fact in our country. Our nation includes people with different backgrounds, experiences, and perspectives. But as the first African-American commissioner in the commission's near 50 year existence, I know that diversity in all quarters is not automatic or guaranteed. I believe it is essential for our elected governing bodies to reflect the diversity of our nation. And I know that it requires a persistent commitment and effort for those of us empowered to oversee and administer the electoral process to ensure that the right to vote and the opportunity to run for elected office are protected for all Americans. So I am here as a representative or a member as the FEC and you may ask what is the FEC and what role does it play in the election system? The commission was created after the, uh, in the aftermath of the Watergate political scandal. Congress recognized that a properly functioning democracy requires a well-informed public and that citizens should know how money is used to influence elections before casting their votes. The commission has exclusive jurisdiction over the civil enforcement of federal campaign finance laws. Now, personally, I view our mission at the FEC as strengthening our democracy and protecting the integrity of the federal campaign process by the federal campaign finance process by one, 
providing transparency to the public about money used in federal elections, and two, fairly administering, enforcing and administering our federal campaign finance laws. Now, although the mission of the agency doesn't directly impact voting rights or ballot access, our work at the FEC, despite obstacles, does have the potential to support diversity in candidates for federal office, thereby promoting a more diverse, equitable, and hopefully inclusive candidate base. But I wanna outline some of the things that I consider obstacles to this, and possibly a solution at least on a smaller scale from the FEC. The current campaign finance system has been found to create barriers for women and people of color who want to run for office. Now here's some of the facts. People of color were less than 20% of the general election candidates from 2012 through 2018, though they are 40% of the nation's population and women of color were the least represented. Women were just 26% of house candidates, though we constitute 51% of the nation's population. Female candidates raised on average 70% greater share of their funds from small donors, and that's who give $200 or less than their male opponents did and candidates of color raised on average a 67% greater share from small donors than their white counterparts, their quite white opponents did. Meanwhile, the relative power of small donors, those under $200 or less, has plummeted with large donors nearly quintupling their share of giving in support of federal candidates. On a legislative level, HR1, we'll probably talk about it later, for the People Act, would have established a federal small donation matching program that especially helps candidates who face systemic disadvantages in accessing large donors and rely more on those small donors, though all candidates stand to benefit. That reform could have particularly empowered women of color, the most dis disadvantaged group when it comes to traditional fundraising. In the 2018 cycle, HR1 could have reduced the average fundraising deficit of women of color candidates by 34%. Now, I told you about the obstacle, but I want to talk about the very small means of which the FEC can make some contribution to correcting this. We have the ability to help this and help uh, create a diversity in our candidate pool with candidate salaries. The commission has that potential to make the electoral process more equitable concerning whether, when, and how much a candidate may pay themselves through campaign funds. Under our current regulation, candidates may receive a salary from campaign funds subject to certain limitations. However, the, our current regulations does not permit, permit candidates to pay themselves from campaign funds equitably. The first problem is that the amount of the campaign salary is tied to the candidate's salary in prior years. This disadvantages candidates with low or no prior income. And the second is the date on which the candidate can be, begin to pay themselves a salary because it's tied to the state primary. And if you know a little bit something about this, my home state of Louisiana, you could start collecting in January of the year, but other states could be later and you have to wait longer for the primary to start to draw a salary. And that could disadvantage you compared to similarly situated candidates from a different state. Last year, the commission received a petition for a rulemaking that asked the commission to revise its regulations to, among other things, extend the period during which a candidate can draw salary from campaign funds, allow campaigns to pay certain health care costs for candidates, and this thus has the potential of drawing a more diverse candidates to federal elections. But I also want to highlight, but that might be a small solution, I want to highlight another obstacle that has been touched on. Campaign spending in the 2020 election cycle totaled nearly 14.4 billion, more than double the 6.5 billion spent in the 20 election cycle, making it by far the most expensive election cycle ever. And looking ahead at the 2022 midterm elections, I've seen projections of 9 billion on political advertising spending alone, which is more than the total political spending in the 2018 midterms. These extraordinary amounts should come as no surprise to anyone. The amount of money spent on federal elections has exploded over the decade, and it's gonna to continue to rise. At the same time, political spending has created enormous challenges to the regulation of campaign finance, particularly due to outdated laws in recent court cases. Political advertising continues to shift from traditional sources as television and radio to texting and online including through social media platforms and streaming services. With this continued shift, the risk potentially amplified that the African-American community 
and other minority groups could again be subjected to micro-targeting of political advertising as a means of spreading disinformation as occurred during the 2016 and 2018 election cycles. Following the 2016 election cycle, the commission received a number of complaints alleging that the use of these and similar online tactics violate campaign finance laws. I'll be the first to say, or not the first to say, these tactics raise novel and complicated questions. Regardless of how the commission addresses these issues going forward, the use of online tactics poses real challenges to the election spending transparency and how, how it disproportionately affects African-American voters. Thank you. Commissioner Borsara, thank you so much for your remarks. Uh, Commissioner Adegbele, let's turn it over to you. Great. Thank, thanks so much, Spencer. It's, it's really wonderful to be with everybody. Thank you so much, Chairman Hicks, for the invitation. So today I'm I'm here really in, in different capacities. One, I'm a member of the United States Civil Rights Commission, has been observed, but I'm also a long, long standing voting rights litigator, and uh, we'll speak a little bit, I think, later on about some of the experiences I've had as a voting rights litigator outside of my, my government context. But I want to begin by talking a little bit about the US Civil Rights Commission and the role that it plays in trying to further equality in our nation. And um, that is not only in the area of voting, though voting has been one of the touchstone issues of the United States Civil Rights Commission since its inception. The origin story of the uh, US Civil Rights Commission began in 1957. As part of the Civil Rights Act of 1957, the commission was created and it was created as a civil rights investigative body and watchdog and advisory body. The idea was that there were serious civil rights issues that were manifest and playing out in different ways across the nation. And there was a need to essentially come to have a deeper understanding about what was happening and what some of the responses might be legislatively and otherwise for the president and Congress. And so this, the US Civil Rights Commission comes out of that moment, that key moment in the history of the nation and at that pivotal moment in the quest for greater civil rights. The charge is broad. Although it's not an enforcement agency, um, al al although we don't have legislative making power, we, we do have the directive to look at civil rights broadly across the federal government and throughout the nation. We do that in several ways. The primary way is that we conduct hearings on specific civil rights issues. And throughout our history, we've often taken the show on the road to do these hearings in places where civil rights issues are unfolding. In the, in the Deep South, um, prior to the Voting Rights Act, recently during my time on the commission, we have been to uh, North Carolina to do an examination of voting and do hearings and take live testimony there. And most recently, we traveled to Puerto Rico to look at the federal government's hurricane response for a report that I'll speak a little bit about in a moment. And so, these efforts to go to see the issues, to understand them, to speak to affected persons are one way that the United States Civil Rights Commission uses its platform to shed light on the issues of the day and to provide useful data and information in reports that are synthesized after our hearings that are made available to the public, to Congress and the president to assess whether there is a need to create a new civil rights law or perhaps amend some of the civil rights laws that exist. The reports that we have undertaken um, in my years on the commission touch a very broad range of topics quite appropriately. We, we often are, are we're statutorily charged with doing what we call a statutory enforcement report each year, which is a report that looks at the civil rights um, compliance of a particular agency. In recent years, those reports have touched a wide range of topics. We have, we have looked at um, most recently maternal health care and health care disparities. In the past, we, we looked at minority voting rights. We did a survey of federal agencies to look at compliance across a range of agencies. We did a report that was called Targeted Fines and Fees that explored the use 
of fines and fees as penalties for people that um, find themselves uh, engaged and wrapped up with the um, criminal legal system. And we have done a number of reports, including one on subminimum wages and the federal law that allows people with disabilities to be paid below minimum wage consonant with existing federal law. And so there is sort of a limited, limitless charge. We, we look to see uh, what are the issues of the day and how we can use the resources to lift up the voices of Americans and to shine a light on the need for improvements to enhance greater equality. And I've been very pleased to lead a number of reports in my five plus years on the commission, including reports on hate crimes, reports on voting, the maternal health care report that I mentioned, currently the look at FEMA's response to disaster relief, where we're looking at disaster relief response, both in Puerto Rico and in Texas. And sometimes that's how these reports go. We, we look for comparators within the federal government and agencies so that we can see, are there things that are happening that are optimal and have lessons that can be learned and lifted up for findings and recommendations? And are there some pieces of the government or the nation that are not really discharging their duty to respect the civil rights of all Americans? The commission is a bipartisan body. We have eight commissioners, which is an interesting number for anybody that has to take votes. It stands in contrast to the US Supreme Court, which helpfully has an odd number of, of justices. And so uh, you, you are very likely to get decisions in one way or another. The mathematics of our commission is that sometimes we get votes and vote things out, and sometimes we're deadlocked if, if the um, vote is 4-4. Four, four. And that changes over time. The president appoints four of the commissioners, and Congress appoints four of the commissioners. And as you've heard, I was appointed by President Obama in 2016, shortly before he left office to a six-year term. It's been a great pleasure to serve on the U.S. Civil Rights Commission. My path and understanding about it is, is part of a story of um, Black civil servants in a way that I want to share briefly as I close with my opening remarks. I learned about the good work of the U.S. Civil Rights Commission from my first legal mentor, the late great A. Leon Higginbotham Jr., who was one of the nation's first black federal judges. He was the chief judge of the Third Circuit Court of Appeals. He was a distinguished professor at many of our leading uh, universities, graduate programs, and law schools. I had the good fortune to study under him when I was at NYU Law School, and he became somebody who was a role model somebody whose career as a leader in public service and the fight for equality I took to be exemplary. And I actually made my early career choices largely to follow him around, much like a new puppy follows an owner around. I wanted to soak up all that I could from this great and generous spirit, from this brilliant lawyer and judge, and to learn from his writings and his experiences on the bench and his experiences as a litigator. And President Jimmy, uh, President um, Bill Clinton appointed him to the United States Civil Rights Commission. And as I worked with the judge on my first voting cases, first as a summer associate and then an associate, we got to develop a very close relationship. And when he got appointed to the United States Civil Rights Commission, one of my colleagues left to go become his special assistant at the US Civil Rights Commission. When that colleague was preparing to leave, I was prepared to begin my career in public service and moved to become Judge A. Leon Higginbotham Special Assistant at the U.S. Civil Rights Commission. Unfortunately, Judge Higginbotham passed away before I was able to make that transition. And so it was with um, deep appreciation for the way in which he invested in my career that on the day that I was sworn in as a U.S. Civil Rights Commissioner and joined by my colleagues at the commission, and my, my own special assistant that I passed my phone to my special assistant and I asked her to take a picture of me standing under A. Leon Higginbotham's picture at the United States Civil Rights Commission. Because in many ways, everything that I have done in civil rights has been informed by what he taught me as a young lawyer, the opportunities that he created for me and the understanding that he gave me that being a voice for the voiceless 
is an extraordinary challenge, but something that is the ultimate reward for every civil rights lawyer. I'm so pleased to be with you, and I look forward to uh, your questions in the dialogue. Thank you so much, Debo. And your remarks about Judge Higginbotham, who was a giant, really remind me of the important role that Judge Damon Keith uh, played, certainly in my career, uh, as well as the important role of Lonnie Guineer, who, um, as you know, was an LDF lawyer, uh, was the first Black woman uh, who was tenured at Harvard Law School and who was just an outstanding democracy scholar. She clerked for Judge Keith and she was a mentor and really opened doors for me in terms of teaching and, and writing about, about voting rights. So uh, as we continue to do this work, you know, it's important that we recognize that we're really just a link on a chain and that um, you know, other people have created us and we certainly have a duty uh, to support uh, others as, as they develop. And so thank you so much for lifting him up. Uh, so right now we're gonna turn to discussion. And my first question is for all three commissioners, as we reflect on black history and the progress we've made in securing the vote and participating in the political process, uh, could each of you share your observation about uh, any insights you have about di diversity within your respective fields and why that matters. And Commissioner Brassar, particularly with you, when you respond to that question, could you also please explain how campaign finance law is relevant to ensuring fair Black representation and fair representation of all Americans uh, in democracy? With that uh, put on the spot, I will go first in answering this question. Um, before, before I answer the question, I want to say thank you for the remarks that everyone has made. Um, Debo, and I, I'm calling you by the first name because feel free, I'm Shauna to, to anyone that I, that I, that I know. Um, I truly respect everything that you said about Judge, Hig Judge Higginbotham. Um, I'm going to take it even on a smaller, granular level. And this is probably... Chairman Hicks, you can bust at me later, but I have this little pin in my hand and it's a pin from my grandmother. And it's kind of a memento that I keep with me because when you say we uplift each other, I am the product of a woman who is from the deep South that uh, did not graduate from high school, graduated, <laughs> was considered the most educated in her family and made it to the sixth grade. And she wanted to be a nurse but she didn't have that opportunity because she was the daughter of sharecroppers. But her greatest joy was seeing the education that was instilled in each of her children. Whether it was a college education, whether it was a trade education, she understood that education was a means for us to uplift each other. So I, I, I apologize for detracting from what I've said, but I was very touched by what you said. And so I greatly appreciate it. I, I don't think my personal character mentor is, uh, is famous, but maybe just as much as famous to me is, is equal of value. So I wanted to take that opportunity. But the question is about diversity in the field. So um, I can answer that I, I'm kind of known for being very, my candor. So it's not very diverse. Um, as I mentioned, I'm the first African-American in the near 50 year of the history of it, but it doesn't mean I am not that there weren't people before me that were more than qualified to be in this position. I just seem to have been in the right place at the right time. It's important because diversity in the federal campaign finance process, uh, this is where the money comes in for the campaign. So we have, uh, you know, the chairman is actually talking about the election process when you go to register your votes. I deal with the money that is spent by the candidates in support and opposition of those candidates. And one of the things that's really important, and I mentioned it, and uh, is that money gets notice. Um, money is discourse. Uh, money also promotes disclosure. And money with the lack of, which is often the case that's happening for minority candidates, um, means that you're dealing with small dollars, but you're not dealing with the support from larger PACs. You're not dealing with the support for 
political advertising and spending, it puts this individual or, or people of color candidates at a disadvantage. So it decreases the opportunity for greater representation. And without greater representation, there is no opportunity for the, to build the equity or the continued diversity that we're looking for in our political system. Now, America is diverse. <laughs> we are an example of it just right now. We are just a small segment of it. And without having the adequate means to be able to run for office, then you do not have the ability to have the real diversity that this country should have in its representation. Thank you. Commissioner Hicks uh, or Adegbele. Sure, I can go. Um, Commissioner Broussard, thank you for those remarks. Um, and um, I wanna thank all three of you for your personal stories out there. Um, and it basically goes to shape us and the people that we are and the service that we give back to our country. And I think that those, those um, aspects are huge. And um, the, you know, I, I still want to talk a little bit about my, my parents and that how they shaped me to um, work in the public sector um, how my mom uh, served as a poll worker for a number of years until COVID happened. Um, I was married to my father for over 50 years until his passing uh, in 2021. Um, but the, the aspect of my dad that I always think about is the fact that he didn't have the opportunities that I had to uh, get an education. Um, one of the smartest people I've ever met in my entire life but did not have those same opportunities. And in the realm of what can people do, and um, hopefully you know, our agencies can get interns um, to, to become mentors towards folks or other aspects of corporations becoming, um, having interns and, and we're moving forward with things. In 2020 and 2021, we saw corporations work towards uh, getting more poll workers out there and becoming more involved politically in terms of um, political participate in the, in the process. And I hope that continues in a nonpartisan way. Um, and as we move towards the 2022 uh, general election, I'm hoping that we can um, have more participation in the process. And what's that mean? It means making sure that people's registrations are up to date, making sure that they know where to vote. Um, and um, one of the aspects that I, I constantly think back to is uh, Hurricane Sandy back in 2012. Why? Because first responders had to leave their homes a week before the election to take care of New York, Connecticut, um, in the Northeast, but maybe not have had an opportunity to cast their ballots. But legislation, <coughs> excuse me, legislation was put out there, emergency legislation to allow for them to cast their ballots. And um, basically the same sort of legislation that we saw in 2020 and 2021, which allowed for people to vote by mail and, and cast their ballots and have those ballots counted. And I'm hoping that we can not look at that as a way of politicizing the, the process, but a, another way for people to cast their ballots and to participate in the process overall. And as Congress looks at, at other aspects, I hope that they look at basically funding those sorts of things as well. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Adegbele. Uh, any insights in terms of the importance of, you know, diversity in your specific area? Absolutely. So, I, the the way I view it is that di that diversity, inclusion, equal opportunity, is a foundational principle of all of the work that I've been fortunate to participate in, in the context of civil rights. the The, the core principle is one of human dignity and the opportunity of each and every person to pursue their life, their dreams, their ambitions without discrimination and free from any of the historical patterns and behaviors and structures that have inhibited uh, some of our promises to our citizens. I think of the role of civil rights lawyers as 
bridging the gap between our high constitutional promises and what are too often low practices that we see in the real world. And that civil rights lawyers are trying to shrink the distance between what we say we do and the, and the promises we make for equal protection and due process and what we actually do. That's, that's the work. And so when you have that perspective, when you come from the life and the parents that I come from, two immigrants from different continents, my mom as a domestic worker on a boat from Dublin, Ireland in the 1950s to New York to work as a domestic worker for a, a wealthy family that mistreated her and made fun of her for her religion at night when she, as the eldest of six kids having struck out, was um, on her knees saying her prayers and hoping for the best. She was ridiculed for practicing her religion by that family and ultimately had to strike out. Um, because she struck out uh, on her own and looked for a different opportunity, she met my dad from a small town called Ire in Nigeria, outside of Ibadan, where he was also the eldest of six and came to be educated in the United States. And they met in a restaurant in New York City. And so I'm the child of these two people, both the eldest of six that came from different continents, different worlds, different religious traditions to pursue their passions in our country. And at the time I was born, my existence would have been evidence of a crime in some states in the United States by virtue of anti-miscegenation laws, having been born before the Supreme Court's decision in Loving v. Virginia. And so my commitment to lifting up all voices and creating space and understanding the contributions of each and every person is deeply rooted in my person. And it, I have tried to mold my career around those commitments in every stage. And so I appreciate diversity because I am the product of open-mindedness and diversity and understanding that judging people as an individual and not prejudging them based on one's own experiences is, is my own uh, um, founding story. I'm here with you now because of that opportunity. And so I, I like to hold it up for everybody else. I also mentioned A. Leon Higginbotham earlier and part of his contributions were his service, his opinions, but he, I learned something else from him. He invested as Judge Keith did in young lawyers. Judge Higginbotham was not more happy and proud of anything than all of his clerks and the people that worked with him. He would, he, would, he would promote them, he would create opportunities, he would bring them into rooms that we didn't deserve to be in. He once told Nelson Mandela that I was working on an important voting rights case with him uh, involving the great state of Louisiana, a redistricting case. And Nelson Mandela turned to me and said, continue to give the judge good counsel, legal and otherwise. And it was that type of person that A. Leon was, to just bring you into rooms, to expand your horizons, to understand the fight for equality. And so I try and do it too. In the law firm, I try and make opportunities. I'm, at, I'm an active recruiter. I'm a mentor. Last night, I joined two uh, former colleagues, Black lawyers who were at the firm. One is now a general counsel of a company. Another is with a different law, law firm and thriving. I stay in touch and invest in people and their careers and their journeys and try and provide such guidance as I can about my own experiences. Big law and law firms need to do better in this area. We haven't moved the dial um, adequately, as you all know. And so we have to continue to keep pushing in that area. In the context of government, we do have interns and opportunities, and we have done a bit better in the federal government and creating, creating opportunities for a range of folks. But nevertheless, we need to be attentive and continue to create those opportunities, work on equality and tell the truth where we have things that inhibit people's progress and where we have workplace cultures that don't live up to our promises. So Spencer, I see nothing as more important than creating fundamental opportunities for everybody to pursue the, the lot, their best lives and, and lives that they can have that respect the human dignity of all persons, regardless of their personal characteristics. And it's something I've committed my life to and hope to continue to lift up in every way. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner. And you know, just to build on this, and this is so connected to both the legacy and the future of Black History Month, uh, just this concept that 
yes, we're all working to make our contribution in terms of our democracy, in terms of civil rights. We want to do a good job. We want to create our masterpiece. But just this, you know, this Mr. Holland's opus scenario and in, in concept where uh, we have gained so much from people who are, have come before us and, you know, our, our, our real kind of masterpiece and a real contribution being the investments uh, in other, other people, recognizing that this journey that we're on will not end with us uh, and, and will continue. Uh, and it's so easy to get caught up in the hamster wheel and kind of the rat race and going through the to-do list and just really important uh, in terms of this theme of investing in, in, in others and holding others up. So uh, appreciate your, your continued focus on that theme. It's so relevant uh, in terms of this month. Um, Commissioner Hicks, you discuss some of the adjustments state and local jurisdictions took to keep voters and election workers safe. Did any specifics develop, did any specific developments have more of an impact with regard to African-American communities? I think that uh, for the most part, one of the biggest um, added features for the African-American community was the vote by mail um, expansion. Um, for the, traditionally, um, more African Americans are working in jobs that are not office based uh, for the most part. So um, when folks are having to um, make a decision on whether or not to pick up the children or stand in line for two more hours to cast their ballot, um, those are alleviated when folks can cast their ballot at home put it in a mailbox, hand it to the mailman, mailwoman, and, um, cast their votes and have those votes counted and have their voices heard. Um, you you uh, cited a statistic of about how uh, the participation of African-Americans in 2020 was at its highest level since 2012, uh, at over 60%. And I think that that's a di the direct correlation of being allowed to cast your ballot in more than one way. It's not a, um, it's been around since the Civil War. Um, it's, it's, it's been vetted, it's been um, made sure that it's uh, legit and um, there are safeguards that are put in place. Um, so I think that that's one of the added aspects. Another was the funding of uh, the CARES Act to ensure that uh, those folks who decided to vote in person could do so safely with um, PPEs uh, and being at a distance. Um, and for the um, larger facilities in order to cast ballots, basically um, arenas and, and so forth. Uh, so I think those are two transitional pieces that, that helped a lot in terms of for the African-American participation in the um, elections in 2020. And I think what's really interesting about that is before this election cycle, vote by mail was very prominent in states like Oregon and Washington that didn't have relatively high numbers of African-Americans compared to some other, other states. So we didn't have this, this kind of history there. And also there were some places like Florida and Georgia, where data suggested that some local election officials were more likely to throw out ballots, uh, mail ballots from black folks than, than white folks, like 3% versus 1%. And so there was some concern, but I agree with you that it was transformational with regard to African-American participation and unfortunately, right now, a number of states are, are actually, now that, that Black folks are using this, some states are trying to, to change laws uh, to add additional restrictions to uh, vote by mail uh, when it's been a perfectly safe and, uh, uh, you know, tool in terms of uh, expanding access. You know, we think about Starbucks and we think about 
Amazon and so many things in the commercial realm where the objective is to make participation uh, accessible <laughs> and make it easier for people to participate. And, and this being an area where unfortunately uh, there have been uh, some, some restrictions that aren't, that aren't based in, in evidence or, or a need here. So uh, Commissioner Broussard, let me, let me turn to you in terms of the perceived tension between disclosure and First Amendment rights at the, at the core of campaign finance law. How do you balance these two interests in the context of African-American communities and you know, other communities of color, uh, you know, their participation in the electoral process? Um, thank you for the question. Um, the first answer is there is a tension, um, but robust disclosure and First Amendment rights can and should exist in tandem. Um, the right to vote has to be buttressed with access to information about candidates, their positions on issues, um, to what interest groups and interests or groups they're beholden, um, because we're all familiar with, with the phrase, sunlight is the best of disinfectants. So at the same time, while there's been repeated and pervasive examples of Black and other racial minority voices being silenced, it's ostensibly done oftentimes through legal means. So I think in those instances, the First Amendment can be an important check on the state. And we have to look at some of the Supreme Court cases in AA versus, uh, versus Alabama, um, and, and NAACP had associational, associational rights to not turn over its membership list, but it, ex, but it still had the exposure that led to economic reprisals, threats of coercion, physical host, uh, public hostility. Um, the lesson that I take away from that case in, in NAACP is that neither the public's interest in disclosure nor the First Amendment have to be an absolute vacuum or exist in an absolute vacuum. But in my role as a commissioner, I have to look at the laws that Congress enacted and set a precedent in the precedent that are set out by the judiciary and, and apply it fairly and consistently as I interpret it. But I believe that the role of our elected bodies and our judicial system, um, it should be to look at the real impact of our laws on society and then whether and how those laws have a disproportional negative impact on segments of our society. And we've got to grapple with the implication of our laws and balance competing interests with the ultimate goal, in my belief, of a democracy that represents and protects all of its members. Right, and, and also just context. You know, the context of disclosure of lists of members of the NAACP resulting in uh, violence uh, toward those individuals is completely different uh, Facebook to disclose that Russian paying for ads for folks targeted at, at Black communities, encouraging them not to vote. This concept of text with regard to disclosure is, uh, is incredibly important. Uh, Adegbala, uh, you have played just an integral role in defending voting rights before the U.S. Court. Uh, now, following a decision uh, and, and let me just stop this here for a second. I'm sorry. I mean, uh, I, I barely get to go in as an audience member in the U.S. Supreme Court, and you can't imagine how much pride uh, that I have, you know, seeing you up there arguing, making the case, knocking it out of the park, doing a great job. So I just want to say that you know, the, these are not uh, unwarranted platitudes uh, here. Just kind of take a take a moment <laughs> to to do that uh, here. You you've just uh, you know just done an outstanding job uh, articulating the perspective of the civil rights community and making these arguments in our generation. You know, you really have been a voice of a generation in terms of. Uh, civil rights in, in the court uh, here. So now, following a decision earlier this month that challenged Alabama's congressional redistricting map, it looks like the court will issue another blockbuster decision in the next term. Uh, can you talk about the court's decision earlier this month and, and, and what's at stake in this case? 
Absolutely, <clears throat> absolutely Spencer, and, and thanks so much for your kind words. I think we, we all try and run our lap the best way we can. And um, as we've been discussing, we hold each other up and we sharpen our skills um, by engaging with colleagues and to, to have an opportunity to be in the fights that matter is, uh, is, is the reason I went to law school. So thank you so, so much for your, your, your kindness. Uh, so this Supreme Court case um, that was really not a, it was not a, it's not a full case yet. It's actually a motion for um, a, a type of emergency relief growing out of a challenge to Alabama's redistricting map, congressional redistricting map. And why is this important? It's important for several reasons. First, uh, it, it, the Voting Rights Act is, is sort of a product of many things, but it's certainly a product of the experience of black disenfranchisement in Alabama. There, there's a reason why Lyndon Johnson went to a joint session of Congress after the Selma to Montgomery March to announce that he was proposing a federal voting rights bill. <clears throat> and the work that the Voting Rights Act has done in really instilling in federal law a minority inclusion principle that was consonant with the objectives of the 15th Amendment after the Civil War. The, the Reconstruction Amendments are called Reconstruction Amendments because it was an effort to rebuild, many say, to build for the first time an inclusive democracy that was gonna treat all citizens equally. But between the period of those amendments after the Civil War and the Voting Rights Act, it was honored in the breach. Uh, black people were excluded from participation in our democracy. The Voting Rights Act was the mechanism of taking that promise seriously, of closing the gap, as I spoke of earlier. And this case out of Alabama uh, arises in a context where the, the claim of the plaintiffs is that the redistricting map dilutes, weakens the political strength and voices of the black residents of Alabama, despite a very significant black population, the number of districts in which black voters have opportunities to elect their preferred candidate in light of the continuing levels of so-called racially polarized voting, um, people that won't vote across race for qualified candidates, um, because race is still a feature of our political systems. It, it means that how districts are drawn can determine the outcome of who can be elected without regard to their qualifications. Mm -hmm. And so how those lines are drawn after each census matters a lot. It can be the difference between having a voice, having your political um, aspiration and candidates have a shot to be elected or not. And the court found under well-established 30-year precedent, the, the trial court in Alabama, that the plaintiffs had met the standard and that a, a new map needed to be drawn to create a fair opportunity for Black voters to elect candidates of their choice and the congressional map. And the Supreme Court, essentially on a procedural emo motion and a, and a special request for emergency relief, wiped away that ruling of the district court that in a lengthy opinion, properly applying the, the, the precedent that had been extant for more than 30 years on this concept of the change is too close in time to an election because the election was seven weeks or so hence. And so the court, in a sense, invoking a, 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 an earlier court precedent called Purcell, said that the value of a degree of comedy according the decision of the lawmakers um, effect is a value that we are gonna elevate above the anti-discrimination principle of the Voting Rights Act. And we will have to run that election under the map that has been adjudicated to violate minority voting rights under the Voting Rights Act, under settled precedent. And, and we will have to wait until after this round of election to mm -hmm. see if we can get a remedy. The consequence of which is that you're very likely to have candidates elected to office who would become incumbents that are elected under a map that very well may be ultimately found to discriminate against black voters. And so there's a tension here, Spencer, yeah. as you well know. So, so, so Dave, let me ask you this. What do you say in response to the argument, the unstated argument that we lifted up this principle because, you know, 
the world is different than it was in 1965. And because if anything, um, you know, this is about politics rather than race, that this is about, you know, a Republican state legislature that might want to have fewer Democratic seats uh, rather than fewer Black seats. Um, yeah, these arguments are, are often advanced and, and we, we, you know, we hear them frequently, but, but what we know is that there is an unbroken pattern in Alabama and elsewhere of using redistricting cycles and using various election laws to try and dilute the, the vote and to impose barriers to black voters. The thing that hasn't changed is the pattern of targeting discriminatory laws and voting changes to weaken the voices and to impede black voters. In, in one of the Supreme Court cases I argued, Spencer, I cited a case that uh, it was called the McGregor case out of Alabama. It was a case in which Alabama state legislators were wearing a wire uh, because there was a, a there was an FBI sting going on about graft in the state legislature. And so the legislators were wearing wires to sort of um, ensnare their fellow members of the legislature in the context of big, big um, gambling, trying to bring bingo to the to the black belt, right? And there was an, there was some folks that wanted the um, gambling interest to come and some folks who didn't. But what was caught on the wire that, that, that one of the heads of the legislature was wearing was that the reason he didn't want the ballot initiative about gambling to be on the ballot is because um, aborigines was the word he used and other negative terms to talk about black voter turnout. How if this ballot initiative was on the ballot, it would lead people to come out and vote. And the person who himself was wearing the wire in the Capitol in the, you know, in about 2014 or so is, is making racist statements about black voters in Alabama. The federal judge disallowed his testimony about his fellow legislator and said that he has an independent reason, which is racism and discrimination and, and holding down um, black voters' voices. And the reason we know this is because the man was wearing a wire being recorded, speaking as he always speaks. And, and so when, when I hear people try and call it something else, you can call it whatever you like. What we know is that there has been a historical pattern of disadvantaging black voters. And we know in the recent election, we saw various places where there was a focus to try and upset the election, various places where there were high concentrations of minority voters. And so if partisanship is part of it, perhaps that's part of it. But the, the real fact is that whatever happens, black and Latinx voters are facing risks to their, to their votes. And we see it play out time after time. Thank you. It's really amazing how wires and, and cameras and video just really kind of bring to life uh, a lot of, of things and, and, and bring them to the, the fore, a number of things that uh, exist, but uh, some have denied. Um, so now this, this question is for all three commissioners. Um, the Senate recently failed to pass voting rights and election and campaign finance reform election in the in legislation that had been passed by the House, but was unable to make it through the, the Senate. Uh, in the absence, and, and, and I'm sorry, with regard to that legislation, uh, there was majority support for it, but the filibuster was invoked and it could not survive a, uh, a filibuster and there was not a support for filibuster reform. Now, in the absence of legislative action, how can your agencies make sure that voters, uh, especially African-Americans and, and voters from other marginalized communities can participate in the political process? I'm here, so I guess I will go. Um, it's a, HR1 had such a potential to revamp the Federal Election Commission and bring some very promising things. And one of the things that Debo mentioned in it is that 
you're on a commission that has eight. I am on a commission that has six. And we are routinely known for our deadlock on things. Um, we, we do generally get a lot of stuff passed, but it's not the big ticket items that everybody is looking for that will have the dynamic impact on campaign finance. And in a simple and very, very simple and resource kind of way, the FEC can continue to use like the social media that we have um, to reach out to voters. But a lot of our research historically has been to our stakeholders, and that is geared towards the entities that report to the agencies, such as the campaigns and political committees and political parties. But it has been something with a particular goal in mind of myself to increase that educational outreach to the public and so that we can use that resources on the website. But we also have to use within the FEC the abilities that we have for our rulemaking process. And we have the ability in that rulemaking process to look at what I already mentioned, candidate salaries. This is a way to increase the political participation um, of minorities, of women, of all disadvantaged, disadvantaged individuals, uh, because these individuals are the small donors. Not, not always. We have seen instances within um, just the Georgia Senate elections where they have individuals that have the ability to raise large sums of money. A minority candidate, um, with minority incumbent, has the ability to raise large funds. But we have the ability through rulemaking to do something about that. One of the things that we've all kind of touched upon is the internet disclaimers, um, some type of internet disclaimers that could help to increase the knowledge about what is being done with the political advertising that we're seeing on social media. As, as I said, when I, in the introduction, traditional media, which if, I don't even know if we can call newspaper and TV ads traditional anymore because we're in the age of the internet, it, it's moving out and the money is being spent in the social media context, online and texting and things like that which is why in this agency, we have to come up with ways to put disclaimers so that people can know who is responsible for the communications that are being presented to them. And the example that all of us have touched upon is the 2016 election. This information, micro-targeting and aggression, if there were some laws in place on a higher level, there would have been requirements for uh, organizations such as Facebook to disclose through catalogs how things are being spent. Um, but on a smaller level, we can start with our websites. I can work on the rulemaking. I am actively reaching out to my colleagues on the other side of the aisle to let's complete this rulemaking. It's been 10 years in the, in the making. And I can say that I continue to get interest on that side, but I will push it as hard as I can. So for the FEC, that's all I can say. <laughs> Thank you. Um, a EAC perspective, one of the um, issues that I see that we have been able to help marginalized communities is with voters who have disabilities. And with the passage of the Voluntary Voting System Guidelines 2.0, um, um, embarked on it, hopefully with the implementation of it, to ensure that they can still vote, the folks who have disabilities can still vote independently and privately. Uh, but with a more secure um, machinery. Um, in terms of things that other aspects of it, for African Americans, um, one of the things that we would say to any person is to check your voter registration. With um, vote purges and so forth, we want to ensure that if you check ahead of time, you can fix any sort of problems that may occur before you get to the polling place um, and rectify those issues so that you can cast a ballot and have that ballot counted accurately. Um, the other aspect that I would say is to the expansion of serving as a poll worker. Um, there's been a lot of disinformation out there about what happens in a polling place. If someone is serving as a poll worker, they see it from the inside and that they get a better understanding of how the process works. And so if you are actually part of the process and, and part of the solution, there's less of an opportunity for folks to meddle with those issues. So thank you. Mabel, any thoughts on that before we turn to the final question? 
Well, our our role, as I've mentioned, is is largely to describe the the circumstances and the need for um, legislation and responses based on the experience that American voters face. And my hope and expectation is that the commission will continue to shine a light, use the light of disinfectant, as Commissioner Bruce Broussard has, has mentioned, to continue the need. Very often legislative efforts are iterative and it takes time to till the field so that when there's a window of opportunity, uh, there can be a legislative breakthrough. And part of it is having facts and an understanding about what the very real challenges are for voters and minority voters in particular. Thank you so much. As we conclude, could you each share your thoughts on how to both remove unnecessary barriers and encourage more African-Americans and, um, and other underrepresented communities to participate in the electoral process? I've unmuted because we have, uh, uh, to the audience that's looking at, we have three gentlemen that are allowing me to just step ahead and, and talk. So I thank you very much, gentlemen. Um, I'm gonna say in my personal capacity, uh, I think that we need to enforce and expand voting rights and make it easier for Americans, especially black Americans to and members of disenfranchised to vote. I, I've said this, time and time again, and it's going to seem very kind of um, maybe a little down homey compared to some of the intellect that's been expressed today, is that when you turn 21, you can walk into a store and buy alcohol. You, you know, when, no one, you, had, you didn't have to register to turn 21. You didn't have to do anything specific to prove it. Of course, you do have to have an ID. Um, maybe in some states like Louisiana, that's really not that enforced. But um, when you turn 18, the same type of thing, which is a greater privilege, the right to vote should be an automatic thing. So on my own personal view, that's one of the things. But one of the things that I think we wanna do as African-Americans is that we should be pushing to encourage participation on a local level, local level, local building up the chain where you start the experience on a local level so that you can work on your zoning laws, you can work on your school boards, you can work on improving your quality of life, you can, in, you can work on investing in others around you in the community, which then can build up that base to move on to the next level, then you can move on to the state level, then you can move to the federal level. I am happy about anyone that can get on the ballot that is a serious candidate about bringing diversity to our federal candidates which is why I am proud, like genuinely excited about moving forward for candidate salaries. Because what I mentioned before is that you have a base that's running that are individuals, maybe white males or, or just individuals that can afford to run for office. They can afford to leave their job for a bit because they have the means to be able to do so. But some African-Americans or some disenfranchised groups do not have the financial resources to stop working or even a, a, a stay-at-home mother who can provide all the skills that she has learned in her life to serve our country and is just as capable as any other individual, but she doesn't have the financial means to be able to do so. By providing a candidate a salary and setting it at a equal measured approach across the board for everyone and setting the time period, we can encourage more individuals, particularly those disenfranchised to, to participate in the process. Thank you. And before we turn it over to Commissioner Adegbele, uh, I, I want to just hold up this point of participation in local elections and real participation. So yes, there are barriers out there, but that shouldn't dissuade anyone from participating. People need to go out. They need to participate. We need to participate. And we also need to participate not just in national and state elections, but also in local elections, which are often held at a different time. There's not the same investment in terms of GOTV. Uh, and as you know, for the first time, I think it was in about 2010, more Black folks lived outside of cities, outside of the urban center and in suburbs here. And in many places like a Ferguson, Missouri, there can be a mismatch 
between the electorate and those people who are elected because of uh, you know, low turnout in local elections. So local politics uh, in terms of engagement and voting and also participating in the civic process between elections and showing up to city council meetings and school board meetings, those are important parts of, of democracy uh, here. Uh, Commissioner Adegbele, uh, any final thoughts on removing barriers and how we might encourage uh, participation? Spencer, I, I take my lesson from the history of the United States and the, the way I regard voting in America, the story of voting in America is that there are two roads in our democracy. There's the, there's the road of trying to persuade people of your vision to, to, to bring people out with policy and excitement for your leadership characteristics, to inspire people, expand the franchise and participation. I call that democracy's high road. There's another road which is less noble, but no less effective at times. And we need to acknowledge it. That is trying to win through subtraction rather than addition, to dissuade voters, to demobilize, to impose barriers. Both of those traditions have deep roots in America. Alex Kazar wrote the book, The Right to Vote, looking at the history of voting in America. And the subtitle is The Contested History of Democracy in the United States. Democracy is contested. It's a fight to pick a road, the high road of democracy through addition and expansion or the low road of democracy through subtraction. Speaking again now, as I have been in the Q&A in my personal capacity, this is how I see it. In the autobiography of Frederick Douglass, he said that he learned something important when his master chastised his wife because he learned that his wife was teaching Frederick Douglass how to read. And the response was so extraordinary that Frederick Douglass understood that that was exactly the thing he needed to do. He needed to learn to read because if there was such fear about the power he would have if he could read, that was the very thing he needed to do. I say to Black America, I say to the folks that wanna be on the right road, if there are so many people trying to deprive you of your voice, and demobilize you and not get you to participate, learn the lesson of Frederick Douglass. Each of us have power to have our voices expressed. That's what the country requires. And so this is what the civic organizations need to do. How about a U plus two campaign? Rather than the demobilization, everybody who knows this value, who's lived it, who has participated in the process, don't just commit to getting yourself to the polls. How about U plus two? get to others to vote. Whomever you wanna vote for, participate, have your voice counted. This is not the uh, position of the United States Civil Rights Commission. This is one democracy advocates study of history and the necessity of us to pick a path. And I want us to be on democracy's high road and to turn away the low road. Thank you, Commissioner Degbele. Commissioner Hicks. I want to echo my fellow panelists and thank them for their remarks. Um, and my thought of how to encourage more folks to participate in the process, I look back to uh, John Lewis, who I worked with when I was a staffer on Capitol Hill and, and had the opportunity to introduce him to a couple of uh, intern lecture series and hear his story over and over again about how he. Um, tried to march just across a bridge to exercise his right to vote and to express his, his um, desire for expression and was beaten basically near death. Um, and to think back on how good we have it in terms of I could cast a ballot that's delivered to my front door and put in my mailbox or just to walk down the street and cast my ballot. That's something that I will do as long as I can. Uh, one of the things that I encourage folks to do is to uh, take their children with them when they vote uh, for the states that allow for you to have other people with you in a ballot in a polling place um, to show them that it's okay. My mother took me uh, when I was nine, 10 years old to uh, cast her first ballot and I had the opportunity to tell the story to uh, President Carter about how my mother 
uh, in her early 30s, early uh, late late 30s or so, was um, able to cast a ballot for the first time, um, and um, it cast it for him for president, and um, had me uh, to witness her do that, um, and that was just truly amazing to me. So I've uh, taken my children with me to the ballot box uh, so that they could see me cast my ballot. And um, those of you who don't have kids, take your nieces and nephews or, um, or, or someone else uh, to show them that this is something that they should do and participate in because it, studies have shown that once people start voting from the first time at 18, they're more likely to continue on casting their votes. If someone starts in their 40s or 50s, They've missed a number of opportunities, but they're less likely to cast that ballot for those local races and so forth. So I would encourage that. Um, the other thing that I would say is uh, hopefully um, we can have more uh, dialogue to, that, that have in more diverse candidates. Um, there's been a lot of talk about um, just basically participation, and I, I hope to have more participation. My goal is 100% eligibility for folks who are able to cast their votes to actually cast their votes. So um, with that, I hope that um, I want to thank you all um, and, uh, and, and turn this back over to Professor Overton. Thank you, Commissioner Hickson. Just building on your very important point, it really is important that we stand up against graphic and, and violent attacks on democracy, whether that's on the Edmund Pettus Bridge or the you know, January 6th insurrection in the attempt to overthrow an election, you know, or uh, more subtle uh, forms that might prevent people, for example, from registering in Selma, Alabama, or prevent voters from being given water or food who are standing in long lines. Uh, the second may not be as graphic, uh, but certainly is a subversion of democracy and we wanna facilitate participation by all uh, uh, Americans in terms of participating uh, in, in our democracy. So as we conclude another Black History Month, I wanna thank Commissioner Thomas Hicks for his leadership in bringing us together for this substantive discussion. Thanks also to all three panelists for their insightful discussion today and for their public service. Please keep up the good work.